let's go ahead and uh, call the meeting to order. Our chair, Mo, is not going to be here tonight. Can you um, repeat that? Sorry. Sure. <laughs> no problem. So, um, so thanks for waiting, everyone. We're going to call the meeting to order at 5.08 p.m. Um, our chair, uh, Mo Kabatu, is not going to be here tonight, so I, as vice chair, will facilitate. Um, can we have the roll call, please? On your agenda. Uh, it's okay it's if you. Mo, not here. Mm -hmm. Wayne Ross, here. Karen, here. Mark, here. Natalia, not here. Rosie, here. Wes, here. Tyler, here. And Virginia, not here. Okay, great. And how many do we need for a quorum, please? Five. Five. And um, what if we begin a meeting with a quorum and lose the quorum at a certain point? How does that affect our ability to do business? I think that um, once you lose the quorum, you can't take the you can't take action. any action. Right. Only information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, okay, thank you for clarifying that because I think we have uh, um, at least one member who has indicated uh, that uh, that member will have to leave the meeting. Early. Should, we, should we move to action items? So, um, so okay, let me look at, uh, do, 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 do. would now be an appropriate time yes. to have this discussion or should we go through approving the minutes and then discuss it? Okay, great. So, um, we're going to receive these reports, but are we going to be asked to, to make an official recommendation? Not tonight. Mm -hmm. Why don't we get through the minutes and then I'll go through. Okay, great. We need to do public comment. No, no, we're, yeah, we're not there yet. I, that's why I'm wondering where to talk about the agenda. I don't see like a gender review. No. So, okay, there's no, there's no expectation of us taking action. So that's good information for everyone to have. Um, we'll go to public comment now. At this time, uh, the Housing Advisory Committee will receive public comment from individuals um, on matters not uh, listed on tonight's agenda. Are there members of the public who would like to address the committee? No, Hi, thank you so much. <laughs> well, very casual. Part of the meeting. Please come, Go ahead. have a seat if you would like, or stand oh. if you prefer. I'll just stand because I um, just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Yuri Anderson, Health Advisor to Supervisor Mary Adams. Um, and I'm just here tonight because Supervisor Adams is really interested in the Housing Advisory Committee, particularly Wayne and Tyler as our representatives, uh, providing additional input to our office as we consider ways to address issues related to housing in the community. So thank you all for your service, and um, really glad to be here tonight. Great. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for coming. And how old are you? I probably have like five, thirty, five, will, five ish. I will kind of mess up with my presentation. Okay, okay. great. So we have uh, no old business. So uh, I'm sorry, we're moving now to approval of the uh, meeting minutes, uh, March 14th. They were sent to us in advance. We all had a chance to review those. Um, I, I didn't print all 72 pages of, of the attachments. Did the minutes uh, include the Pasadena project that we reviewed last time? Here, let me show you the minutes. I think I highlighted Inclusionary something. housing, you know, the guy wanted to get out of the rentals and so forth. This is the it does make reference to it, yes. And I highlighted a portion there because I had a question about it. But okay. since I'm sharing, All right. if Thanks. someone else would bring it up, I'll wait to see if someone else brings it up first. Anybody have any comments about the meeting minutes from March? No? I, I had a question. Um, well, I guess someone should make a motion, then we can discuss the motion to approve the minutes or incorporate changes. I move that we approve the minutes. Thank you. Motion Seconded. to approve the minutes. Second by Tyler. So discussion on the motion. I would like to, I have a question about, um, I have a question about uh, to a future, it says to a future meeting, I think is what it said. My recollection it was till this meeting, so it's under four old business. Um, it, it isn't up to, to another meeting date. date. It doesn't have to person to come to us again. I mean, we're not in control of that. No, we're, waiting we're waiting on that individual to come forward again at that time. Got it. Mm -hmm. that time, the decision will be made. Got it. Right. So I thought that, that that person wanted it, like, right away. And even we talked about having a special meeting because the person really wanted to come back. 
So that's not a mistake. It's just another meeting date. Fall yeah, is in right. their court. Okay, claro. Um, so we have a motion on the table to approve the minutes, and there's been a second. Um, looking for conversation for uh, comments. No comments. So we'll take a vote on that. All those in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? Thank you so much. The minutes of March 14th are approved. We have no old business. We'll move on to number six, new business receiving a report on referrals from the Board of Supervisors affecting housing, and that will be followed by a hold on a housing study session. Okay. Um, so hopefully you all have, everyone had an opportunity to look at the housing uh, referrals and the staff reports. Um, there's actually a fourth one out there that deals with the reorganization of the housing office. Uh, for those of you who have not heard, Dave Spar was laid off uh, June 30th, so uh, the county lost its economic development director, uh, and the housing program manager position is currently vacant. So it is me and Rosa. <laughs> wow. Okay. The whole committee right here. The whole this is the whole wow. staff. Well, we have one other person full-time equivalent, but it's two people part-time managing our finances and correspondence. So, um, so are there questions about the, the referrals that we, or how we have responded to them in the past? That, that was pretty cool. Okay. Uh, the, on May 22nd, when we went back to the board with the uh, response to the uh, regional housing needs assessment in the three-year uh, strategy for affordable housing, we were told to come back with a more refined plan and tell the board what we could do with current resources. They, they were not looking for us to come back and ask for money. So we, as we started getting into this, we realized we just need to do a housing study session to address not just these three issues, but the larger uh, issue, uh, the issues that have been raised through like the farm worker housing study, and the Monterey Bay Economic Partnerships white paper on housing. So we're, we're planning to do that. Up until today, it was scheduled for October 9th. It got bumped to, to a day that I'm on vacation, so now we have to find another date. Uh, we're working on that, okay? Uh, what I'd like to do tonight is kind of give a dry run of, this is a very rough draft. I have a lot of work left to do, but what I'm looking for is feedback um, on what I would present to the board when we have this study session. Okay. Um, and since Tyler has to leave and, and Yuri I know is interested, um, I will start on slide 15 of the PowerPoint presentation. It should be slide 15. And it should say role of the Housing Advisory Committee. Um, so, uh, this is what the, the county's inclusionary housing ordinance says your role is. Okay. Um, at various times, staff has come forward, and, and some of you may remember Mr. Zanetta or Mr. Brooks and their request to rent their owner occupied rental units. Uh, county Council has opined that the Board of Supervisors never delegated that to this body. Okay, oh. so that's one of the things that could come to you if the Board chose to delegate. Right? It hasn't happened. So it, it puts us in a weird place where uh, we have this direction from you and staff move forward with these, but then county council said, well, staff didn't have the, the authority to make that decision, only the board had it. Um, I, I don't know their, I don't know their rationale or anything, so I can't answer those questions, okay? But it certainly puts a, a constraint on what we can bring to you and how we deal with, with issues, okay? Um, so I think one of the things that we should probably address during the housing study session or perhaps during a separate uh, uh, item with the board is what do they want to delegate to to the housing advisory committee okay. uh, what authorities would they be comfortable doing what authorities would county council be uh, comfortable with them delegating 
so I, I mentioned the issue of uh, um, renting units, uh, owner-occupied inclusionary units. Pasadena um, certainly uh, makes sense that it would fall under your purview, but it's not entirely clear that that the board has de even delegated that to you as a as something to to make a recommendation on. So that's something that we need further guidance on. Um, and kind of complicating the whole role of, of this body is um, even whatever you decide, say on Pasadena, say that we go forward with a recommendation, ultimately the, the Board of Supervisors has delegated land use decision making largely to the Planning Commission. Okay, so you're an advisory body to an advisory body to the Board of Supervisors, <laughs> which it just it's an extra layer um, that you know we need to make sure that everybody understands and what that means in terms of time particularly when we're dealing with time sensitive projects um, other activities that we are involved in where there may be a role for the housing advisory committee um, back in the old days okay, 20 years ago 15 years ago uh, Monterey County we had a a, uh, we use the Housing Advisory Committee to evaluate projects once a year that would be going forward for home funding and uh, funding through the State Community Development Block Grant Program. We no longer have to go through the State for Community Development Block Grants. Uh, and the Board has taken that approval upon themselves through a subcommittee. Uh, the timing of home, it was always kind of hard to know to, to evaluate projects because of the way that project financing works. Um, and we would have to do your considerations in uh, January. We'd have to request the proposals back in late November or Dece early December. But then they would sit for eight months until the state issued the RFP. So it was, there was a big disconnect. Um, the other area where there is certainly uh, room for the, the hack to be involved in and needs to be is in how we use the uh, inclusionary and loofies that we collect. Um, and we used it, that was part of this whole January action that the board, that the hack would take was to make recommendations on where we, what nonprofits we would use those monies for, um, for the, in the next year. Uh, we need to get back to that. Um, I do have some concerns that with, with how we do it, uh, but it's something that we do need to bring back. Um, and then the other one is, I, the board has never asked us, and we frequently haven't had time to have the hack weigh in on um, things like the housing related parts program that the state ran for a couple of years. The, the application deadlines were just too short for us to get the hack together and then get the, bo the Board of Supervisors to, to get the application approved. Um, and frequently it was the board members that were pushing it. So. Um, we also have uh, a number of uh, housing loan programs that are fairly, that are basically inactive right now, uh, but there may be a rule for the hack to review those loans if somebody were to come in and ask for a deferral or, or some other action on them. Um, if that was something that we were going to look at, we'd also have to look at the underlying uh, state and or federal regulations governing those dollars as to who has to sit on those bodies. In some cases, there is statutory requirements that you know, the county treasurer sits. Um, and, and part of our problem is, is we have I think it's seven or eight different loan sources that we've used in trying to come up with one round peg for that round circle that is of different diameters is a challenge. Um, something that we can work on. Um, but that's kind of a, an overview of what the hack is. So one of the things that we have to get is more clarity on what the board wants to delegate. Okay. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, you might want to look at uh, Santa Cruz County's uh, Housing Commission just as a frame of reference. I think they're a lot more active and I think they meet monthly 
and they're a commission rather than a committee that um, might be interesting to have a chat with you know your counterpart over at the county <clears throat> um, also you know if the, if the bond measures pass in November but SB 2 and 3 there's going to be a lot of money coming down the pike potentially and so he, hopefully you know your stat will be staffed up and hacked up for for that type of activity. Uh, yeah, um, and and that will also there. As I go through the per, my presentation, we'll come to some of that. Um, so that's kind of that particular slide. Okay, so it's it's food for thought as we go through the rest of this. But I wanted to put that out there while Tyler was still here and Yuri was. Um, I'd like, uh, I'd like to hear, you can say the same words again, simply, be, uh, you don't have to describe it another way. I just want to take that in about the county attorney's decision on uh, the, the they should have been dealing with them at all. Correct. And they should go, be going directly to the board of supervisors. Okay. okay. Um, can you use the word for them again? Uh, that would be inclusionary owner occupants if they want to rent or request an early release okay. it should be going directly to the board of supervisors and when was that uh, clarification offered or uh, determination made earlier this year but it, it came up specifically because of a rental unit mm -hmm. um, well, it's going to be it would certainly narrow the process because right now it goes through us we say no if we say no and most of the time you try and retain the stock for for rental affordable rental you're saying no um, and then you turn around and it goes to the planning commission because it goes through that and then it goes to the board of directors and ultimately they make the decision so and that's been the case that i've observed almost in every case where we've rendered you know no decision yes yeah. mm -hmm. so we, you know, that's, that's a, and that that it has to coincide with the, 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 the meeting time, and so right. for the person that's waiting for an answer, it's way down the line. Okay. okay. All right, so now we can go back to the first slide. Uh, so my, my goal for the study session uh, is that at the end of it, I will have presented and some other individuals will have presented information to the board that will help them start thinking about specific goals and objectives. Right now we have some very generic, nice sounding, we want to support the, the creation of affordable housing or housing in general, but we don't say what we want to do or how we want to get there. So later on in the presentation, I will give you a very specific example of what one county has done. And I want the board to, to think about that. I'm going to get there by uh, presenting information on the current housing market that we have here, the, uh, the current resources that the county has, some case studies from local housing nonprofit developers, the housing authority, uh, and a private market developer who is involved in building uh, employer-sponsored housing. Um, as well as bringing in some of these other examples and figuring out, laying out options for the board to consider of how they want to use existing resources and what additional resources can be committed and what may come out of those additional commitments. So let's start with an overview of housing needs. Um, we have the uh, 2015 20, 20, uh, 2023 Regional Housing Needs Assessment. This is state law. Uh, comes down to AMBAG with a, a number that has to get distributed across three city, three counties and all the cities. Monterey County's allocation is 1,551 units in that eight year period. 374 of them being low, uh, very low, 244 being deed restricted to low, 282 deed restricted to moderate. Um, the good news, we've met 55% of our obligation. The bad news is it is heavily skewed to the above moderate. Um, in addition to that, we have the farm worker housing needs study that was done for the Salinas and Pajaro Valleys. Uh, that identified a need of 5,000 units 
the goal of creating 5,000 farm worker units. And these are units along the lines of what you see at Tanamara Now, which is one unit, two bedrooms, four people per room. But they went further and refined it. They'd like to see 75% of those be in Monterey County. Well, that works out to 3,750 farm worker units over the next five years in this county. Um, and just one other thing, you'll notice that we have 106 low-income units. That includes 100 units, uh, 100 doors at Tanamore and Anna. It gets weird even when you have to count on and count the, uh, the units there. You don't get to count the people or the beds, you count the door. So if you have one person living there, it's a unit. If you have eight people living in, the, in there, it's a unit. Okay? So, that's the way that works. The, the math is kind of screwy. Okay. Um, this will look much prettier on a big PowerPoint because it's in color. <laughs> um, over the last uh, 10 years, the county has issued, finalized 1,555 building permits. 60% um, of those units were completed within the last five years. Of those 1,500, East Garrison accounts for about a third. Um, only three new multifamily rental projects have been in, completed in the unincorporated area in the last 10 years. Okay, uh, it gets worse if you want me to if you want me to go there. 90% um, of the apartment complexes in the county that have more than 100 units were built before 1990. They're, they're approaching 30 years old. They're starting to get to the point where unless the property owners have been making significant impacts, they're reaching functional obsolescence possible. Okay. Um, there are, in the last 10 years, we have only produced 14 new inclusionary rental unit, ownership units at the moderate income level and none at the low income level. Um, I know there is interest uh, from the board on ADUs. We have built less than 100 in the last 10 years, um, and it has slowed down significantly in the last five. And okay, we're averaging 12 units, 12 ADUs per year in the first five years. We're down to five over the last, uh, per year in the last five years. Um, when you say we, you mean the private market? The private market, yeah. Yes, the private market. Um, new housing, this is just where we've been putting it. You see a lot of that is at Fort Ord. Um, I want to point that out because it's an important thing to consider. East Garrison, which accounts for 60% of the construct new units since 2016, received its entitlements in 2004. Okay? It did not start building units until 2014. Okay, so that's 10 years from entitlement to first unit. It is. Okay. Now, in there we did have the housing meltdown, uh, but all things being equal, given the pent up demand, we, would have ex we should have expected better. Um, and then almost all of the new units in the greater Salinas area are attributable to um, Spreckless Crossing, Tanamar and Animals Project. Okay. Um, and then the other big one that's not reflected in here because it re wasn't in the permit report that was run is um, the uh, Baranda Villas, which has another 75 units of employer-sponsored housing. Uh, Multi-family vacancy rates. Again, this is going to be very pretty in color. Um, okay. the, the important thing to note is um, right now our five-year uh, average vacancy rate is about three and a half percent. The last 12 months it has been uh, two and a half percent, okay. countywide. What was the percent, I'm sorry? Three and a half over the last five years. And what was it before? That's the last five years. Most current 12 months it's two and a half. Um, I, 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 I didn't want, I don't, don't use this stuff too liberally yet. I have sure. to have it all vetted, but, 
Um, most uh, housing professionals and economists will tell you that a 5% vacancy rate is healthy and, and more than natural rates, so we're way low. Okay. Uh, Employer-sponsored housing, this is a big thing considering we were looking at needing to produce somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,750 of them over the next five years. Right now, we believe that there are as many as 150 employer-sponsored housing projects throughout the county. Okay, it's, a, it's a hard number to pin down. Um, under the California Employee Housing Act, it's the responsibility of the, the Department of Housing and Community Development to permit these units. Uh, they've delegated the privilege to Monterey County Environmental Health and the City of Gonzales to permit in their jurisdictions. However, up until May of this year, the Employment Development Department was inspecting uh, employer-sponsored housing as part of their responsibility under the H-2A program, but they were not telling those property owners or managers or farm labor contractors that they were also obligated to register with HCD or the county. So those units are all uncounted and uninspected. Um, that's why I say that this is kind of a, a hard number to pin down. Um, environmental Health currently inspects 39 uh, properties uh, in the county in the unincorporated area. This graph shows uh, the distribution by, by planning area uh, of the number of units. Remember, it's doors, not uh, actual people. Uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting is we actually have uh, the Big Sur Coast being a, a fairly large consumer of employer-sponsored housing. It's also um, the only place that those are the only employers that have used manufactured housing in a, as a way to address the need for housing. Um, the 39 projects in the, in the unincorporated area currently are permitted to house 1,656 people. Um, but Panama Canal and uh, Baranda Villas can request uh, an increase in their permit that would allow a total of almost a little over 2,400 people to be housed. Um, there's some weird thing going on I don't understand. Uh, I'm trying to get environmental health to help me out here. Uh, Baranda Villas was permitted for 75 units, eight people per unit for a total of 600 by the building department. And that's what the environmental document was prepared on. They only select, asked, and paid for permits to house 120 people. Similarly, Tanner Murnell was permitted to house up to 800, but they only asked for environmental health to permit 500. Um, there's, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around why. Uh, I'm trying to find out who to talk to those companies so that when I get to the board, I hope I have a better answer than what I just gave you. Um, HCD uh, permits an additional 17 projects throughout the county, 13 in Salinas, three in King City, one in Greenfield. Gonzalez permits two. Um, most of the units in the city, when I, when I started looking at the addresses and, and going on Google Maps and looking at the pictures, appear to be converted hotels, motels, or apartment complexes. And that's a, that, if that is the case, it is putting a huge strain on displacing other tenants into an already tight market. Um, if there's anything good in the, in the equation, and by the time you get to the board, this will be known, uh, whether it was approved or not. But there is a 1,340-bed uh, farm uh, employer-occupied uh, employer-sponsored housing project proposed for Greenfield. Wow. It was approved, uh, but appealed to the city council. So that's supposed to happen later this month. But it met all the zoning requirements and everything. Uh, so we'll wait and see. Uh, at this point, I'm going to ask uh, Alfred Diaz and Fonte from Chiefsby to come up and, and describe his experience with developing a project in the unincorporated areas. After him, we'll have someone from Mid Peninsula Housing come up. Um, I think she's going to discuss uh, their project here in, in Chinatown, here in the city of Salinas. Um, Which is modular as well, right? No. It's not. I thought they that, got, pre that's, not prefab. What no. Is it? 
the, the Haciendas. Oh, that's okay. the Haciendas. That's a that is the Housing Development Corporation. Got it. Um, but their project has taken the better part of, I believe, three and a half years to come off the ground. And this is a project that the city of Salinas supported. Can you imagine what it's like for a project that doesn't have the city or county behind it? Um, and then the last up, we'll have uh, hopefully uh, a presentation on Veranda Villas, which is the employer sponsored housing in Veranda. Uh, and then we're going to have um, the Housing uh, Authority come in and explain their programs. Um, there is, they're doing a lot to try to, to attract landlords and property owners to come in. Uh, there are some challenges with it simply because um, the market is so hot that t the property owners believe they can charge more than the housing authority can pay. And they are apparently finding tenants. Um, there are some bright spots. Uh, I was contacted a couple weeks ago by a property manager in Marina who has units that are off-site clients for a project over there and I was able to hook them up with the housing authority so hopefully he'll get some Section 8 or Housing Choice voucher tenants in there. And I believe that they've worked that out. Uh, so there, when local government has that requirement, there are opportunities. Uh, our program, when I started looking at it, uh, we actually set the rents below the Housing Authority's fair market rent, what they can pay. So the disincentive here is because of the way our program is structured, the housing authority would ordinarily step in and fill the gap between what the tenant can pay and what the, the market rate is that, that, they, that they can pay up to. And, and our inclusionary rentals, we don't allow the housing authority to come in and make up that gap. So the landlord is really taking a bath with, with the inclusionary rentals that we have out there. That may be something that we want to look at is you can do up to the, the HUD allowed limit, um, but not to exceed 30% of the, the household's uh, monthly income. And that would put it more consistent with some of the other programs. Um, and may make rental properties a little easier for us to, to encourage. That's a policy consideration that will come back down. I don't ever remember us being involved in establishing Is that something that yeah, it's, uh, yeah, well, okay. Um, it hasn't been done since 2003 or four. So I don't know how involved you were in the administrative manual or the ordinance drafting back then. Yeah, I don't know the rentals. Okay, so. Then it comes back to me. Um, so the question then becomes, what do we do in the housing office? Well, right now, we manage the county's interest in more than 200 owner-occupied inclusionary units. We have we monitor the county's security interest in more than 200 inclusionary rental units. We manage four distinct loan portfolios with more than 170 loans and an outstanding principal balance of uh, almost sixteen million eight hundred thousand dollars. That's all. That's, That's all you do. Okay. Don't, don't you oversee the uh, housing planning documents, like the housing elements and inclusionary housing uh, um, policies? And yes, we do. Thank you for bringing those Add up. that in. Um, wow. Okay. Wow. Uh, okay. Um, within the inclusionary housing program. Rosa processes approximately 35 requests to find out what the value of, of a home is every year. Uh, those are for either resale or refinancing purposes. Uh, if they refinance, there's a whole litany of documents that have to be prepared and executed and recorded uh, that Rosa uh, would be responsible for preparing. Uh, we coordinate the sale of an average of three inclusionary units annually from one income buyer qualified owner to an income qualified buyer. Um, a lot of Rose's time right now is being taken up with East Garrison. She's done, as I mentioned, the uh, the 14 townhomes, and she's done, uh, how many workforce? That's the number I'm still looking for. Uh, 
it's like a total little bit left, but that I have to oversee the consultant that's qualified them. Make sure that I'm doing it um, and then we uh, do income qualifications on an average of seven uh, renters annually. Uh, we have down payment assistance loan, assistance loan programs um, with three distinct types of loans. Um, the usual, you know, just a regular cash loan where we're a, 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 a second position lender, uh, up to 20% usually. Uh, we have a, a number of our, our down payment assistants that are grant to loan. So uh, if you were lucky enough to get one of those units, uh, we gave you 20% down. And if you lived in there for a fixed amount of time, they converted to a grant. Uh, and then we have uh, forgivable self-help. So if some of the uh, subdivisions out there <coughs> received financing, that would basically pay for your labor. Okay, so you had to do the work, but we found financing that would pay for the materials or the land or the utilities or the fees or whatever. Um, and these are typically 20-year loans that beginning in a year 11, they're forgiven at 10% per year. So after, if you live there for 20 years, that's all equity to you, uh, without any resale restrictions, unless there was some other program that had them. Um, but because we have these three different kinds of loan programs, it's a nightmare for our accounting staff, mm -hmm. as we have to keep track of how much we write off every year, which meant that it had to go on the books in the first place. Um, most of these loans are 30-year deferred. So what that means is, in order for that down payment assistance loan to help you, we have to defer our loan so that your monthly debt to income ratio is attractive to your first lender. It works, it helps get you into a house, but 30 years down, you have to refinance our note or be in a position to take this out. On the program side, because you're not making amortized payments, that money is essentially gone until you either refinance, sell, or the term ends and you either pay us in a balloon or refinance and pay us in a balloon. It's not a reliable income stream. It's not a good way for us to have to go out and, and be able to have a self-sustaining program. Um, we also do multifamily loans. Um, and these can be everything from uh, the hack used to uh, make small loans or, or grants to organizations like Dorothy's Place and Chispa. Uh, and then we moved into, we also manage uh, multi-million dollar home loans where we applied for a home grant from the state. We receive it, we pass it through to uh, a project like Chispa and Sea Garden Apartments in Castroville. Um, these are typically 55 year loans uh, on residual receipts. Uh, they're a loan with no expectation of repayment. So again, it's $4 million or, or in Sea Garden Apartments case, it was a $2.8 million loan that came through the county and went out to Chispa for affordable housing but we are not going to get that money back within my lifetime for us to finance another project. That's just the way the, the, the financing works. Is this the level of detail the board wants you to I think share so. with them? Okay. I think so. That's what I hope, uh, that's what I, I think they do. Uh, Darby, mm -hmm. have you considered uh, contracting out? I know there's some, you know, small consulting firms that do that kind of thing, at least in Southern California that kind of loan monitoring and stuff, that, that way you could use your staff and your resources for the more creative things about hustling some of this money in Sacramento and so forth. I just wonder if, if you've ever looked at the numbers on that. Um, one of our challenges is our portfolio is small, so it's not an attractive portfolio for servicers. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been burned by servicers. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we are still cleaning up files from some of those services. So, um, it's something that we probably go back and look at again, but it's a very small portfolio. Yeah. 
the last portfolio that we have is um, our small business loan program. Um, that fairly small, but it, it supports job creation in, in Monterey County. Over the last 30 years, it has created, helped create or retain about 1,100 jobs. Um, it's a small, again, it is too small a portfolio to have a huge impact in any one case, but if you got one of those jobs, or it was your startup or your expansion, it's a big deal. Uh, Resource-wise, so we've already talked about uh, vacant housing program manager. We have me. Uh, I focus on CDBG, the inclusionary project review. So this is when uh, a developer comes in and wants to do a 100-unit subdivision. I do the calculations and write the condition of compliance. Um, I also uh, have been doing all the policy work for this report, uh, and I staff the small business loan program uh, when it comes up. We actually contract out the day-to-day -day services on that. Um, so I only have to participate to do the, the reporting and look at the loan underwriting that is done by a professional loan underwriter. Um, then we have Rosa, we've already explained. She, her life is the minutia of uh, inclusionary homes and, and single family loans. We manage six county funds with about $5.2 million in, them, in appropriations for this year. We have three million uh, currently available for the, that is restricted for the development of affordable housing or to manage affordable housing projects. Because of boards, the board not giving us a consistent uh, general fund allocation, we eat away a little bit every year at those dollars and at money that just goes goes out. How much? Three million? Three million. So you have it sitting here available for affordable housing? I can, look, see, I can see somebody raising it. Is now let me that? put this in perspective. Okay, yes, we have three million dollars. If there was a project that would fund eight units, maybe. Okay. Okay. It funds maybe eight units, and it's a one-time fund. Or if it's leveraged, you know. Well, yes, it, it would have to be leveraged, but our share would would generate. It, it costs roughly three hundred seventy thousand dollars to build a unit, and we would get. It works out that it's eight. Yeah. Eight point one. Um, so it sounds like a big big pile of money, but it's when you put it in perspective of cost per unit and the fact that once we spend it, it doesn't revolve. It's a one-time shot. Okay. So one of the things that we need to think about is how do we create a sustainable fund for locally controlled affordable housing dollars? Um, about 980000 of that is from inclusionary and new fees and uh, loans that are being repaid to the Inclusionary Housing Fund. That is the money that we can use to pay Rosa, to pay me, to pay consultants. Again, any, every time we step in and use that, it's gone for those purposes, it's gone. It, it doesn't revolve. So back in, in August, the board approved two contracts, one with the City Data Services to help us hopefully streamline and uh, better manage our asset portfolios. Uh, and a contract with Lasar Development Corporation to um, rewrite the county's affordable housing ordinance. That was almost $300,000 right there. That's a $300,000 that it, 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 it was needed, but it's money that is not going to be available again. Okay. So we also get about, um, $400,000 annually to support county-driven community development block grant projects, um, and about $150,000 annually to drive uh, to support county-sponsored uh, public services, such as uh, Central Coast Center for Independent Living, or um, food, bank food Bank, Rancho Cielo, Food Security, uh, Rancho Cielo Employment Training, uh, you know, a whole myriad of uh, youth development programs, uh, 
the things that everybody says are important, but nobody ever steps up and says, oh, we have the excess money to do. So we are a very small piece of all those organizations' uh, funding picture now. We could certainly redirect those dollars to affordable housing if that was what the board wanted to do, uh, but some of those organizations can survive, some of them may not. You know, I don't know. Uh, we've talked about the role of the housing committee. Um, and that's 15, right? What's that? Slide, that's slide 15? Yes. I'm okay. So, um, one of the other, one of the issues that I've heard the board uh, repeatedly express an interest in is how do we create more housing that's affordable for the workforce? This is a challenging um, area. One of the challenges that we've seen is once you start pricing units for households that are making up to 180% of median income, which is the maximum under the county's workforce two classification, you start to bump into, depending on where we are in the housing cycle, that price point being what the market is. And so then the issue becomes, why would I buy a Workforce 2 unit that's going to come with a one-year price restriction and the county is going to limit the amenities that I can buy as part of the construction package? Or I can buy the same unit without those restrictions for, you know, essentially the same amount. This is market cycle dependent. But, put it in perspective, East Garrison right now has an obligation to produce workforce to housing. They are trying to steer people towards it. They are offering a $3,000 credit towards closing costs to encourage people to take it. And they're still having trouble. Um, yeah, why would you buy a piece of property with restrictions when it's nearly okay? No uh, at so, and and it's not the first time. Back in 2008, the board released uh, workforce two restrictions on 123 units at Chapin's Rogie Village uh, Commons at Rogie Road project because where we were in the market cycle at the time, Chapin couldn't sell the units. So from a business standpoint, he came to the board and said, I need you to lift this condition of approval. You're essentially getting workforce units without the restriction. So as we go forward and we think about how we want to address workforce housing, the market cycle is going to be an important part of how we, where we price things and how we think about those units. Uh, also, because these units only have a one-year term of affordability or resale restriction, it creates a lot of work for Rosa to prepare the, the, the documents to secure the restriction and then turn around a year later and prepare the documents and record the documents to release them. So it's, it's a lot of extra admin work that for, for you know, a, a very short uh, gain. Something that, that, as we get into this, I want you to think about. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if the board's going to want me to go here, but it has come up from URI uh, on rent control. Um, and it is something that is going to be on the ballot in November. Um, there's not a whole lot of empirical research on the impacts of rent control. Um, but generally, it is considered to be an inefficient policy tool. Um, there was a study, and I, I haven't, I found it referenced, but I haven't been able to find the study, so I'm a little leery without going to be able to get it. But, but the study did find that in San Francisco, it has reduced uh, available rental housing by 15%. Um, they estimated that it was a $5 billion economic loss to tenants who were not in rent controlled units. But it did mean that 10 to 20% of the tenants who were in the units would remain for decades. So it does give housing security to those who benefit, who, who manage to get in there. Um, the basic macroeconomic theory on, on it is it does lead to housing shortages, it's a disincentive to new development, and it does lower property management standards all things that are important for us to consider. Uh, what makes a good location for housing development? Well, um, 
What the developers have told us is they need a minimum of five acres. In this county, that's a lot. Uh, there's, we're trying to figure out where that that exists um, that makes sense. That's not prime farmland. That's not farmland of statewide importance. Uh, that's not in a floodplain or in the coastal zone. Um, and then the other big consideration that they have is they need to be within a half mile of a Monterey One water wastewater line. For every mile that they have to drag a sewer line, it costs them a million dollars. Um, so they need to be close to cities or, or, com or communities that have existing wastewater treatment systems. Um, you might want to talk to Midpan about the size of their uh, properties because I can think of a few that have two and a half acres. They've done a few smaller, but this is what even Betsy was there and, and said they really, they really want to see five, especially it, because right now um, a lot of our a lot of our, our redevelopment area, old redevelopment areas like Castroville, which is the only one that has a, a community plan limits you to three stories so it's hard to get the density on two and a half acres that you need to be competitive for tax credits so they really like to see the five acres and and that's what uh, the employer sponsored housing developers want to see too Again, there's pent-up demand but it's got to be in the right place yeah I, I, I see this ideal but I'm wondering if it's really a minimum it yeah it's it's what they would prefer yeah yeah it, they, they certainly have worked with smaller, but yeah. all things being equal, they would prefer the five, and they would like to go to higher densities yeah. than what they've been able to do. And, and of course, to get funding, especially from federal or state funding, that you want to be near transportation and services. Right. Yeah. So what that what that tells you is, uh, we're really talking about more city center growth. Okay? We're not talking about urbanizing uh, San Arno. Uh, so now, now we get to the meat of this project, uh, of the presentation, goal setting. Sonoma County, the Board of Supervisors sub-regional housing production goal is 30,000 new units countywide by 2013, by 2023, including 3,375 new units on county-owned land. And uh, 30,000 is inclusive of all the cities. Um, the average number of new units permitted by the county from 2013 to 2017 was 716. The current average number of ADUs per year, because ADUs are an important part of their production, is about 50. Okay. Think back, I said we were averaging about 178 units over the last five years. 60% of those are at East Garrison, which was entitled 10 years before the first unit. So as we think about setting maybe some numeric goals, with that in mind, what would those goals be? Um, the uh, Sonoma County goal is to not just address their, their arena demand, but it's also to address the historic <laughs> under construction that they've, that they've experienced. And they had a consultant come in and do that analysis for them. Um, looking at the farm worker housing study, um, they estimate that there are about 48,000 units short uh, for farm worker housing, and that would be family and uh, the employer sponsored variety. Say the number again. It's about 48,000. Okay. Uh, so, with these numbers in mind, we need to think about what goals are reasonable and then start thinking about policy alternatives that will address them how we can address it. Recognizing that the county is not in the building game. We do not build housing. We only create the environment for it to be built. Um, in talking to, uh, back in, in May, I came to you with a long list of uh, activities that could support affordable housing. Talking to developers, talking to the employer-sponsored community, um, Probably the, where we would have the greatest impact is to complete community plans in Baranda and Chular. Um, 
and, the, and complete the nexus study in Castroville so that we can uh, hopefully get rid of the, uh, the transportation impact fee there, which is $19,000 per unit. When you have to create, uh, when you're trying to create an affordable unit and there's a $19,000 traffic fee for the redevelopment agency for projects that the Coastal Commission has said will not be built, uh, it doesn't pencil out. So we need to get that funded. We need to um, look at the, the Monterey Bay uh, Economic Partnerships uh, white paper and had some recommendations on increasing densities and using floor and area ratios instead of uh, units per acre, uh, maybe relaxing some of the height restrictions. All that could go into the community plan. And the thing about the community plan is once it's in place, a developer can then tie up a piece of property and know that the entitlements are almost by right and that the county has already done the heavy lifting so that when I buy that four or five acre parcel in Chular, I know what fees I have to pay to expand the, the sewage treatment plant. I can factor that into my financial perform, performance. And I know that I'm not going to be delayed by lawsuits because it's already been through the environmental review process. It gives the developers the certainty that they need to move forward. Um, other things that we might want to consider, uh, supporting federal legislation to support uh, increased funding for USDA uh, rural assistance. Uh, the farm worker housing study points out that you know one of their recommendations is we need to be more competitive for USDA section 514 and 516 loans. Great, when I talked to the, the state program manager for those programs back in, in April, California is already submitting the 10 most competitive applications in the country every year. They can't fund 10 applications a year from California. They'd be out of money. They have to spread it around the country. The only way we get more out of those programs is if Congress increases appropriations. They're great programs, but it, it's something that the board would have to add to their legislative platform. Um, other things that we could do, we could look at pooled sharing. Uh, pooling uh, the arena obligations so that if we pool our financial resources and remember that that three hundred seventy thousand dollar a unit number uh, and the three million we have if we could pool that with somebody else who had another million and a half all of a sudden you start to talk about real money and if you have a way that that money is coming in year after year, like SB2 from last year will, will do, that will generate about $650,000 to the unincorporated area annually. But if you throw in the city of Monterey and the city of Salinas and the city of Seaside, and we all cooperatively use those dollars, we're looking at about a million and a half. Similarly, if there was a county-wide home consortium where we got direct funding from the feds every year it would be smaller than what we could get than any given project could apply for but the reality is is state home is only giving out two or three four million dollar grants a year and our our number would only come up every three or four <coughs> years but if we had two million dollars every year in home plus another million and a half every year from uh, SB2 countywide, we might be able to accomplish them. But that's going to take some leadership from the board talking to your elected counterparts at the city councils to, to get them to start thinking this way. Um, other things that the board has mentioned is looking at how, how maybe we could set up uh, tax sharing agreements so that we move money from community A to a community that has a, a higher blue collar labor force. Again, happy to do the legwork on it, but at, at the end of the day, those kinds of things have to be politician to politician. Uh, they make sense, but do you want to see your the county unincorporated dollars flowing into Marina or Greenfield or, you know, for housing? It's something to think about. Um, and then I would give you some details on uh, 
what the Baradda community plan is supposed to estimate it to cost, uh, how long it would take, and then we would try to come up with an estimate of the number of housing units that could be built there. Same thing for Castleville, same thing for Chula. You'll be doing a great that. I have slides for them, I just don't have the numbers yet because resource management agency haven't given them to me. So some of, the, some of the recommendations we were just making a moment ago, are, are those the kind of recommendations the board is looking for? Or is there, are they looking for you just to present what, what is and what some of the hurdles are? Or are they looking for what the opportunities might be as well? Uh, they're looking for both. Oh, for all of them? Okay. Yeah, I think that's, they're all looking right. for everything. You know, the, the challenge is the, the, what the development community has told us is the biggest thing that we can do to support housing is the community plans. Okay, uh, but if we go back to the May 22nd direction, no new resources. Community plans. The last one that the county did in Moss Landing. Think about how big Moss Landing mm -hmm. is. Was three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Um, if we do them for, and just using that as baseline, that's 700,000 700, to do the two more plans. Plus it's, uh, I think Public Works was saying it's gonna be 100 to 150 to do the Nexus study in Castroville. Castroville's got some property projects that have come forward and withered on the mine simply because of the impact fees. Um, you know, it's, the, those are the opportunity areas that the development community want sees. That's where the development community sees the opportunity to step in and make a meaningful contribution to building housing in the county. We don't have <coughs> the luxury of having large contiguous county parcels that are well sited that are not currently being used. The way, Santa, the, the way Sonoma County did. Sonoma County has this huge uh, admin complex with lots and lots of parking spots that they don't need, apparently, and, and they figure by tearing down buildings and reconfiguring the use, they can, they can build you know, a couple thousand housing units. And the city of Santa Rosa is okay with it. Um, we would have to figure, we don't have a similar type of property in this county that the county owns. Yeah, we could look at it in the cities and, and see if the cities have anything. And again, if we have you know, a mechanism to, to share the, the heartache of, of getting it through the entitlement process and the funding process, it might work. But, you know, we, but the big one is going to take board to commit financial resources. The, the freebies are going to require political capital. And, and the meaningful ones are going to require hard dollars. In the attachments, you mentioned a three-year plan. Mm -hmm. And how does that play into this? Well, so the three-year plan um, would probably start with, in an ideal world, we don't build housing. Um, so all I can say is that in a three-year plan, the best that we can do is create the environment for private sector developers to find attractive projects. And we do that by simplifying their entitlement process. Uh, if the board were to fund, and this is something that's going to come up, um, the community plans, um, the RMA will be able to tell us about how long it would take, and I'm going to guess it's two years, uh, if they fast track it. Um, and then in, in the, that third year, you know, the developers would actually be in a position to line up and, and start tying up property and, and getting their financing secured. Um, but we were probably three years before we start seeing new housing, unless we start looking at how we pool the money. Uh, so that we can uh, build adjacent to existence. So 
So on top of the housing element, you need a three-year plan? I mean, I can um, see a supervisor say, so, don't, don't plan me to death. So the housing element, That's like, you don't, I'm just planting a seed there. Yeah, no, I, I know. The, the, the housing element, and I, you know, and I covered this partly back in, in uh, uh, May, but the housing element identifies some specific sites that, would, that are for housing development. The problem with those sites, when you start looking at them, is there's a huge number down in San Arno. There's a huge number of potential units in Castorville on property that is prime farmland. Okay, so yes, it is set aside for that purpose, but in reality, it's probably not real estate that we can count on. It's the same thing with the affordable housing overlays that the board has established in the general plan. We have this very nice parcel in Carmel Valley but once you get out to Mid Valley and everybody's on septic, a large, intense multifamily project doesn't work. Similarly, you know, you have the, the Merrill property right there at 68 and Reservation, where the Merrill family, the Merrill corporate office is. That whole field is currently farmed, but it is set aside as an affordable housing overlay. I, I think. I think the plan, though, would be speaking specifically to identify, you know, rapid residential development where the yeah. housing element is yeah. broader than that. It's, right. it's a higher yeah. level of sand. This we're, property could be used if everything if everything was available or worked. But now we're talking about a, th a three-year yeah. plan that would say, okay, we're talking about a rapid. You know, yeah. a lot of things have to be done in order to make it a, a rapid yeah. development. There with the money coming down. So I think you need to. Yeah. Define that a little bit better. Because I think you'll get that question. If you don't get the question, uh, they're thinking about it. Yeah. Why do we have an elephant? Well, and, and there is state legislation that is going to, if it is signed into law, significantly change housing elements. Um, you know, for a long time, jurisdictions have put a list of parcels in, knowing that they can't be developed. Right. Well, the new legislation that was signed last year, so it's already there, is if, that, if those parcels are the, on the list and remain on the list for two cycles, which is four years, you have to remove them and go find new parcels. So it's going to create a new planning cycle for, for RMA as we have to now go, oh, well, those don't work. We have to find something that's real. Um, and so that's where the community plans come into play. And, you know, going back to the community plans, that's going to set you up to have identified parcels that have a realistic option, opportunity to develop, as opposed to stuff in Pine Canyon outside King City or San Ardo or uh, Olmstead Road behind the trees off 68 <laughs> um, that can support 2,000 units at 20 units to the acre. And it's an affordable housing overlay. So in theory, you know, if the property owner wanted to, they can come in and do it. And we can find the water. Oh yeah, that. It's not like we find the stuff. Okay. So something more on the three-year plan and more on the housing elements. Or be prepared. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, yeah, I just wanted to mention something about ADUs. I think trying to create affordable ADUs is, is tough. I mean, it's going to require a lot of subsidy. I think just making it easier for the private sector to, to create ADUs is, you know, without getting too involved in, you know, rent, you know, are they rentals or not, you know, I, 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 or a forgiveness program, an amnesty program to, to help make you know, people that already built them illegally to help them make them legal, I think is good. But in the city of Santa Cruz, I know they get a lot of press and so forth for their ADU program, but $80,000 for ADU. Um, if you're lucky. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if, if you look at it, um, 
if you look at Santa Cruz County actually did a, a nice little report on financing ADUs. And if you're going to do a, a ground up ADU, you can expect three hundred and fifteen thousand dollars for a, oh, really? for an eight hundred square foot ADU. Wow, that's the price of uh, a new home in Gonzales. Yeah, a rental yeah. unit. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure that it's the most practical. Um, and then you know the other one is the, this idea of junior ADUs, where it's uh, you have Basically, you take like the master suite and you turn it into a separate unit, the set, but you have a shared hallway and maybe a shared uh, bathroom. But LA County has been looking at trying to get bring those in and legalize them so that they could and, and subsidize them so that they can make them affordable for homeless people to move into. But what they have found is is that a lot of those units were built by families for older family members. And they don't want strangers moving in. So, you know, the Supervisor Alejo is really big on ADUs. Oh, they're, they're great. The, and, and, and as a market tool. As a market tool. And, and you know, the, over the last 10 years, we've built 40 guest houses, which under our, the new county ADU ordinance is built. Now it's easy to plumb and turn into convert to an ADU. So it's 40 units that are fairly easy to turn into an ADU if the property owner wants to. Um, they do come along with restrictions. Which... No, they don't. Is that right? Yeah. ADUs are not restricted. So one of the challenges with ADUs is... I thought there, I thought there was some on your Stanford, just like there was some restrictions that they had. Or... They, they have yeah. some... Uh, the affordable ones have some restrictions. Yeah, that's, yeah. What, that's, what, that's the part. Yeah. But, they, but the, the, the trend is to loosen up. Yeah, well, I would think you want, yeah, if you yeah. want them, you better loosen up. I would, my, yeah, so, my, my implied uh, comment would be that you just don't want to have restrictions on them. And if they're not, that's yeah. the way you want to go. Yeah, the, the idea, some of what Santa Cruz did is they would trade, you know, setback or parking restrictions for affordability. Um, we might be able to do that. Uh, some of the things that we could do to make ADUs easier, one of the things that Santa Cruz County and the County of Sonoma have done is you plug in your address and they tell you if you're someplace that has an ADU because like Monterey, County, Santa, Sonoma County has areas of water shortage. And so if you're in one of those areas, you just can't build an ADU. Okay? We have areas similar to that out in, in San Benicio among others. Uh, but you can plug in your address, it'll tell you if you're eligible and how big an ADU you could build where you're at. But wasn't, wasn't there were some restrictions as far as converting them to vacation rental stuff? Huh? That's a big issue in Santa Cruz. Yeah, that's, yeah. Not, that's where I read it. Um, they, they, build a, they build a unit and then they turn around and rent it uh, on, you know, for yeah. a weekend rent. They're trying so to get a so, so somewhere along the line you have to end up with some sort of restriction if you don't right. want that to take place. Or um, so Santa Cruz, and, and that might work at a city level. It's harder at the, just geographically, I'm thinking it might be harder at the county level. Oh, yeah. Um, location, Santa Cruz, location, yeah. you know, Santa Cruz has a, uh, already requires home renters, rentals to be licensed. Um, so they have a mechanism in place already to kind of regulate who's renting. Um, and then in terms of uh, bringing out of compliance units into compliance, um, Santa Cruz County has a program, it's a limited liability release, or a limited liability indemnification. And basically what it is, is if you as a property owner have an illegally built ADU or converted unpermitted unit, uh, they will come out and work with you to inspect it, make sure that it is safe. If it's safe, they will issue you a certificate that, you know, it's not building code, but it, it looks safe. Yeah. Um, and then if your neighbor complains about it, it goes to the bottom of the code enforcement list. Um, you know, yeah, everybody wants the county to come out and look at, yeah. look at their units to see if it's safe. Yeah. Um, you know, so there, there is that. The other challenge with uh, subsidizing ADUs is if you start taking public money, or even what, what 
uh, LA County Council and uh, the City of Santa Cruz, the City Attorney have opined is that if you waive fees, it constitutes public funds and it's now subject to prevailing wage, which adds about a third to the cost of development. Sorry, I must say that the story you used to have was really good. Yeah, I thought it was pretty good. You know, it took a while to get to it and be organized at it, but it's not like the organized part of it seemed to be about three, four months. Well, it wasn't just a lot of money. No, I was going to go back to the wrong order. No, it was great. It was good. I just, I kind of got lost in it. And that's because I've been in the scene and I've been, well, that's part of my challenge trying to organize this is there's so much to, um, but the goal is that we have a discussion at the, at the board level, because um, they need to understand. So the dates, the ninth is off and you, and you, the yeah, was what? Yeah, I'm on vacation. Good. October 16th. Well, you don't want to change your vacation just for this? He needs a vacation. <laughs> yeah, I missed my, my backpacking trip, so I need a vacation. Any other feedback? Or? I would only ask you, you know, once you sent something out, it's going to be established. Yeah, I will. Because sometimes I miss which board meeting, I don't want to do a general. And with regards to other things that the, the hack might be involved in, do you have any? Uh, is, you know, we, do you want to, when we prepare the, the uh, annual report date, housing report date, so do you want us to bring that to you before it goes in? Do you want to receive it? All you would do is receive it as information, there would be no action. Well, sure, why not? I mean, not to watch it up, but. <laughs> Well, I think we ought to be involved before it goes. I mean, well, what are we here for? Yeah. What are we here for? Just to read. Well, but that's the testimony. Yeah. I mean, if we're just going to be a rubber stamp, then. Yeah. So, and so that, that's actually a good example of yeah, where time. things get convoluted. Is for some reason we have. Prepare the report, but the planning department has to submit. It. They have to give Rosa the information for her to type in the report to send back to them to submit to the state. The secretary service. <laughs> um, and, and you know, so it's, it's we we do some good things. We're not meeting again for another. Two months? Probably not, yeah. Yeah. So, so, I, yeah, so we can, yeah. but when, you know, how does it work with when, the deadlines? When the supervisor of, of the district, my district, uh, asked me to be on this, he said, you know, I don't know anything about affordable housing. I need some, uh, I need some, I need to bounce some ideas off of, you know, and, and for you guys to look at this stuff. So I think we ought to be involved in proposed policies, sort of like we're doing tonight. Yeah. But as far as getting an exemption, you know, all these guys coming and asking us to you know, get them out of their inclusionary units. The city attorney wants to handle that or whatever, let them at it. But, uh, that's, that well, happens a lot. I know, but, a lot but, of but the policy but, stuff, I mean, we, we, so, yeah. so I guess, yeah. you know, so I, I laid out some of what I have come up with as policy ideas based on meeting with the development community and RMA and meeting with um, and talking to, to people up and down the state. Are there things that you think we should throw into the mix that you've heard about or, or think might be worth exploring? Um, I, I think um, that you ought to, even though you say you, you, you know, you're just the function is the plan, I think you ought to gear it towards. Yeah. You know, and housing development, and, and instead of 
instead of creating a perception that we just want to create more plans, maybe you ought to maybe create the perception of there's this money coming down, likely the farm worker housing, and uh, you know we want to do everything we can do to, to make that happen. You know, rather than we just talk about plans and plans. And plans yeah. And all. So actually, just a perception. Okay. You know, then you're going to meet with developers or nonprofits or whatever and, and be ready. You know, as you said in here, one of the plans said, we got to be shovel ready. You know, yeah. and we got to yeah. compete. Yeah. And, you want, and maybe you want to emphasize, we want to compete with the other 56 right. counties. And, and, and the challenge is, is, you know, SB, there was a reason that 50% of the first year of SB2 funding was for planning. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, so it hasn't come down yet, but you know, I mean, it's. A, I, I think that you know the, the state sort of recognized that you know there may be a need to do some planning to to get projects that are shovel ready, um, but again, without a community plan for Miranda or a community plan in, in Chula, well, Chula we have some lots that that are available. Um, we know that there are infrastructure constraints, but if we know how to address them and what the path to addressing them is because of a community plan, that makes the project that much more shovel ready. Right, and maybe that's just creating that perception of you know, it's Yes, it is a plan, but it is the plan that says, here's what we have to do to build these units. Right, right, right. You know, without this plan, Yes, the units could be built, but it is going to take longer, cost more, and miss funding opportunities. Right, we're working with the development community yeah. to yeah. make this happen. The other thing I was going to throw in, uh, I haven't figured out exactly how, is um, you know we have Tatamar Animal that has 800 bed spaces. Um, we have uh, Baronda Villas that has another 600. They only use them about nine months a year. Coincidentally, those three months correspond to COVID months. Um, there may be an interest by the property owners to rent them to social services as shelter space, but they're they're gonna they're not in the housing business. They're gonna want something where social services comes in, right. takes them over, and then three months later, you know, March first, social services that and that unit is the same way it was when they turned it over the first time. It may be a way to provide cold weather shelter space. But it's something that is going to take some work uh, by social services to do. And I'm not going to tell you that there is interest they, or not. They, it's, it's something to explore because you have an inventory of units that is mostly unused at that time of year. So if you're looking for a quick fix, that may be something. I, we haven't done the, the legwork on it. I just threw it out there to que as a question when I was sitting there with with a couple of representatives from ag companies that have these units. They said, well, we hadn't really thought about it, but we're not in the housing business, and we want the units back the way we gave them to you and when we need them. Do you want to direct social services to We'll make the introductions if you want to have social services go that route. That's, yeah. There were a couple other items in your attachments. Um, one was you talked about budgeting for three different positions, mm -hmm. besides the housing manager, an analyst, uh, uh, county council, and somebody oh. else. Was that you haven't mentioned those? Uh, that was part of my May presentation, and we kind of moved away from that. Oh, okay. I, I what I did with with the stuff that Anita emailed out, that was background to get you caught up to where we are today. 
So some of it has been superseded. So, out at the old airfield, okay, that's that's where I've heard things like that come up. Okay, um, I haven't heard the tiny homes one, but uh, I have heard uh, using housing building out built out of shipping containers going in out there. Um, yeah, there there is interest mostly by people outside the valley to do it. The, the folks who live there want to purchase the property and turn it into a park. So there may be, that would require a zone change. So there may be ways that we could give, that they could buy it, but not have a park on the whole thing and have some piece set aside for housing. We haven't had any formal conversations with anybody that I know about. The other challenge is, like I said, all of Carmel Valley is on septic. Yeah. You know, so if you were to put in a multifamily project out there, you're starting to look at having a not insignificant amount of space set aside for, for septic uh, or figuring out how we get regular treatment out there. Um, and I think regular treatment will go over like Led Zeppelin. That's, the, that's opening the door for for us to pave everything. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I've heard ideas like that floated over the last few years, but nothing that I know that's ever materialized. One of your attachments mentioned um, a AB 571 or something, but it's about extending the time that the migrant housing centers are open. And you have a number of those in this county, and they're probably open. I don't know, four or five months out of the year, but uh, that might be a short-term band-aid for some of your farm worker housing yeah. needs. It could. Might be something you want to get behind. Uh, that was Those are state-owned migrant housing centers. I'm not sure we have any of those here. Uh, pretty sure you do in the county. Probably South County or... In South County we do. Yeah. Not state owned. Morningham City isn't state owned? I bet it's worth checking. And it's occupied year round. Oh, is it? Um, Maybe not in un unincorporated areas. Okay, maybe not. Um, I know Santa Cruz has one in Buena Vista, outside of Watsonville, um, but it's for migrant families. Um, although I hear most of your farm workers are here year-round these days. The majority of them are just in the report. Yeah, we have a... Schools are making it really difficult for them to be migrant anymore with the kids in school. Well, and, and even what we're hearing is... Um, you know, that the housing authority was just telling me this the other day. When they have units in Gonzales, even if they have somebody who has a voucher, at, for, um, but they live in Salinas in overcrowded conditions, they don't want to. They don't want to move to Gonzales and uproot their kids from school. You know, so you have a you have the personal dynamic overlaid with affordability and availability. You know, so just because we build the housing in Gonzales doesn't mean that the people are going to go. Yeah, because I've had a couple of people with vouchers 
homeless set-aside vouchers that we've been able to get for them and offered them places in King City, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't take them. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. Yeah. And even a short distance like that, it's strange. Okay. So where do we stand on item six? So this is a discussion item. Uh, I'm looking for feedback. Uh -huh. um, so where do we stand on feedback? Some people have offered a lot of really good information we haven't heard from other folks. Is there more to put there? So, um, if you think of something afterwards, yeah. email me. Yeah, if you, and, you know, if you think about, so if you think of something, email me, or uh, if you th if you think about it and, and take it to your supervisor, that because I have been asking the supervisors, aides, you know, is there stuff that you want that your your boss wants to hear about? And we said anything, so it makes it really hard to mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> for me to sit there and go, okay, I have three hours and. Am I going to be looking at a bunch well, of blank faces, or? <laughs> well, if I've read through this, you've said you've certainly uh, articulated the obstacles that exist. Yeah, well, I'm trying to get around to the positive side. <laughs> you know, I think I've looked pretty deep for that one. The, the, you know, I, I, I've been here 20 years. The county's been talking about city center growth. And I think that the lesson that, that I'm taking away right now is that's what the developers need. You know? They need the county and the cities to, to figure out how we're going to play nice together and not pave the county, but at least set where we're going to grow that are next to cities and, and come up with standards that when we approve something in the unincorporated area, the city isn't going to go <coughs> over. Yeah, you're going to have a couple of them there, and I my observation looking at the board of supervisors, they, they listen very intently when they get up there and speak to them. So I think it's important to make sure you, know, you talk to them about what's important to get across. Yeah, I, you know, I, I would, I'm trying to get them to tell me. It's until I get there, they won't have thought about it because they've got other things that they're thinking about. Right. So, you know, this is uh, something that definitely is. Sonoma County, when they did their study of uh, unmet demand, that came up with the 30,000 unit number. They they figured that Sonoma County has economically stagnated because of the lack of housing. And when you stagnate like that, it means that you can't even you're no longer going to be able to provide the services for the people that are here, <coughs> let alone grow the services for new people or expand the services for those that are here. So we need to, housing is an important issue to, to get around, and it, it's going to need some time, and it's going to need energy and money. Um, but, you know, we also need, uh, one of my soapbox, if you will, excuse me, is, you know, MBEP and uh, this California Housing Partnership California Housing Partnership just came out and said Santa Cruz County has a need for 12,000, an unmet need for 12,000 units. Um, and they have some policy recommendations, and they're very generic. They're, they don't say anything. You know, they, they look good, but then you, you come down to somebody like me, or you go to the planning department, and you go, okay, what does this really mean? How do I implement this? You know, um, I have the housing developers, the nonprofits say, we want you to have somebody on staff who can walk our projects through. Well, what does that really mean? I'm not the planner, I'm not the person who, that's not the person who is processing your application for the planning commission, for the board of supervisors, to get the entitlements. All I'm doing is standing over that person going, do your work, do your work, do your work. Where's the value at? <laughs> what does it really mean? That, what do you really want? What you really mean is you want us to hire more planners to process the applications. That's what it really means. Do they give priority, supposedly, to affordable housing projects? In supposedly. This well, supposedly. then that, maybe that should mean a planner shepherding the project you're planning and building in public works. You know, the, and, you know, I, I Is that any housing element? Because if you have that kind of language in your housing element, 
have something to we do planning? we do but you know the, the other part of it is is um, they come to you and they go well they're not processing it for and then you go ask the planner and they go planner will well here's the letter and here's what's still missing mm -hmm. right. and then you go back and you go well yeah. and they go, well they can't move faster than you're giving them the data okay ignore whether or not the data makes sense the, the request makes sense but just they're a bureaucrat they've got a box but they've got a check and unless there is legislation that removes the box they're going to ask for it and you can sit there and beat your head and pull your hair until you're purple and bloody but at the end of the day to move the project you've got to let them check their box right but it does help when you have somebody helping the developer to ship yeah kind of walk through city hall and kind of explain some of the permits and the yeah you know fees and unfortunately they can't explain it. that's part of our problem is you know if, if you were to sit there and go what are the fees and permits for this project mm -hmm. and which of them can be waived if it's a 55 and older what? yeah and, and they can't tell you they, you know, so so one of, one of my favorites is I went in and I said, you know, I'm just trying to figure out, I want to replicate what Santa Cruz County did in terms of saying, here are the fees for an ADU. Okay, so I gave the planning department specific parcels in four parts of the county. And I, and I said, here's what I've proposed to build. Can you estimate the fees for it? They couldn't do that. So having that, so that could go into the pot or slide or a conversation about yeah. Uh, what you do, yeah. right? And another slide maybe is what you don't do because people seem to think you do a lot of things you don't do. So that might be another thing to say, here's what we do, here's what we don't do, but the public or other people yeah. think we do. And then here's here's our wish list for what we, would really allow us mm -hmm. to do this. And, and if there's a way to say that and keep a good relationship with your colleagues That's in the other yeah. department, right, that hopefully is, you know, not negative about them but it's just kind of that what or when this happens when this happens with our uh, with the planning that's really great for what we do when we have the information that we can give them that says this that's really great for doing what we do creating the environment for building homes um, yeah well one of my favorites was uh, years ago I first started with the guy who working with the Moss Landing Harbor District to rehab the Santa Cruz Cannery building. And the, the project manager for the district came up to my house and said, Darby, can you help me? I said, what's the matter? And she goes, well, I went to planning to, to build and to, pull my, to pay for my permits. But the planner was, the, the building inspector was at lunch, and so they couldn't tell me what my permits were going to cost. They said, just leave a signed blank check. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh. Uh, I'm like, huh? <laughs> on, on that note, you can't calculate the fees, so you want me to leave uh, uh, an endorsed check made out to the county, and you'll call me with the amount that you fill in. That's um, that says a lot in many ways. It does. I I I wish I could tell you that it was different, but I don't know that it is. <laughs> so, is there anything more that we need to go over for the new business section? right now um, for committee member reports so we will put in that uh, if it works in with that April 1st timeline and you having to fill it out and sending it to planning and getting it back do you think we can uh, can review the material doesn't go to the board before it does it yes see okay. and I'm not so, really the person in charge of the report so, so the way it works is she requests this for me and then I work with their planning with one of their planners to get okay. the numbers I prepare it and I send it to her and she's like in control of it uh, when she completes the rest. Right. So whenever when it comes to in, the board, we, our preference is to not rubber stamp. Our preference is to have meaningful input and help develop policy um, early on. Okay. Um, it, but if that's not possible, we'll take just looking it over and at least having the information. As soon as I have it finalized myself yeah. and I, yeah. I've, I've sent it back to yeah. the planning department, I will let you guys know it's so ready. So both and yeah. yeah. hearing and taking in what Mark said and understanding. Well, we kind of worked through a lot of it today. Who knows when you're going to get yeah. it. Good. So 
again, and, you know, what my, my final request would be is if you have things that you think I missed, things that you think I need to pump up, right. uh, or that you think the supervisor should be paying attention to, please share them. Uh, and, and contact your, your, your appointing supervisor and let them know what you think the important issues are. And ask them to communicate that back down to me so that I know that I need to address that in the presentation and be prepared to facilitate a discussion on it. Mm -hmm. That's really what I, I want is to be prepared to facilitate a discussion that the board feels is productive. Okay, great. Any other comments or input right now? And we all know how to email to get the information in. So number seven, committee member reports. So I said what I said about the last piece. Anything else uh, committee members have to say on HAP goals and HAP housing advocacy related matters? If not, we'll move to eight, updates from staff, um, housing projects, and other housing related matters. Um. No new projects. Um, Rosa's just going. You have the affordable housing data management system. Oh, okay. So, so yeah. yeah. So, uh, thank you. We um, uh, on August 28th, the board approved a contract with City Data Man Services. Uh, we're in the process of um, hopefully what it's going to give us is a better way to manage our our 400 units that we have a that we have to keep track of. Um, allow us to spend a little less time on the annual monitoring because people can su submit stuff via uh, electronically and if they don't submit it, they can't submit. Um, and allow us to run reports to go, who do we need to follow up with? Uh, right now that's a, a lot of manual tracking that we have to do in spreadsheets. Um, we're also, one of the first elements that we're looking at is trying to figure out how to automate our interest list. So we have these 200 odd inclusionary owner occupied homes. Uh, we have about 400 people that are interested in buying them. And we get about 40 new that ones. Has the number has doubled now with these garrison. Yeah, we, get, about we get about 400, 40 a week. So what we want, we're trying to figure out is wow. how do you use CDS to automate that process so that uh, we're not looking at each and every one of them for what's basically a stated income loan qualification right, letter. Just, you know, did they check the boxes and does it make sense? Mm -hmm. And say, thank you, you're on the list, we'll get a hold of you when you get available. <coughs> um, and just free up a lot of staff time that way, we hope. It, but it's taking a lot of work to get us there. Um, Rosa was here seven hours on Saturday, um, eight. I was here for four. Because um, we're also using it, the opportunity to digitize our files and, and make sure that we capture the correct information. Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to scan all of the recorded uh, documents that are in each single file. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what, you know, one of the challenges is, you know, because so many of our loans are deferred, we've never actually had, we don't have a clean list of all of our loans. We just know that we have paper files for them. but. I'm guessing that that 16.7 or $8 million outstanding principal is close to accurate because there may be loans on paper that never made it into a spreadsheet. Um, and so that's not good asset management. Um, and we're talking, you know, some of our loans go back 30 odd years to the 80s. Um, you know, so, so we're doing that. That's now underway. Um, also on the 28th, the Board of Supervisors approved an agreement with uh, Lassar Development Consultants to start the uh, affordable housing ordinance process. That will be coming to the HAC uh, at a couple of points. Um, I'm hoping that October 9th, well, when we do the housing study session, um, I will have a summary or, or starting to have a picture of what the de a met demand is for housing that I can include um, and the opportunities in new state law for us to look at how we might enhance the affordable housing ordinance. I'm hoping that that's right. Does that include the inclusionary housing? Yes. Okay. So, so we are 
The general plan changed the name from inclusionary to affordable because it now includes the workforce one and two levels. So <clears throat> we have to address those. On a short-term basis, there was um, litigation, I think, with Carmel Ranch, uh, Carmel Valley Ranch. And we have to amend the inclusionary housing ordinance to reflect the 25% with 5% uh, workforce. So we have to, that's just the court saying, go do this. Um, so we're doing it and recognizing that it's going to change again. Uh, but that will hopefully free up the, that roadblock on that particular project and it will get out of the way and give us some units. So I want to um, uh, say anything I like, I really liked this coming in draft. I really like the draft information and all the background and the draft version. I really like that. And so when you're doing all these other wonderful things over the next several months, um, I don't know what the how that uh, dovetails with uh, something becoming public record and everything, but I like I like draft things. Okay. So um, if we can, and, and I think that we can also be helpful yeah. uh, in supporting the limited staff, very limited staff. Yeah. So that's my understanding. More brains. Yeah. Trying to recruit. I don't know how that's going. Can I ask the question? Yeah. Um, uh, when you guys are going over the applications for the inclusion or affordable housing, if you can, Hi, would you say your name, the, please, and what the, town you're from? Sorry. So we're going to reopen public comment because yeah. we have someone who came in after public comment, and she would like to uh, join the conversation. I just say your name. Curious. My name is Noelia Castle. Okay, thank you. I'm Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. um, I have a daughter that's a single mother, and she applied for the affordable housing April of 2017. Mm -hmm. She received the email that you all were interested, but we haven't heard anything after that. So would she get a follow-up email, or do we have to reapply again? No, you don't have to reapply. So she would have gotten a letter saying that we've received her application, she and did. and that based on that stated income stuff, you know, she was eligible. Yes. Okay. Where we have a hard time communicating is. Uh, I don't know when you came in, yeah. but we only get about three existing inclusionary units that, a year that turn over. Uh, okay, so, you know, depending on, she's probably in the top 300. Um, you know, don't be just totally discouraged. Um, we're, we have a lot of units in the pipeline, but the market hasn't built them yet. Um, depending on where she lives now and where she wants to live um, and what her situation is. And this is, she may want to look at the City of Salinas as an inclusionary program, it's separate from ours. Uh, the City of Monterey has one. Um, it's all each different, different city. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt yeah. right now and say um, and say yes that this this conversation should continue mm -hmm. yeah. and we'll we'll take it back to the meeting and encourage the conversation to take place once we adjourn. Yeah. Thank okay. you so much for bringing it up because yeah it's a um, good question. So uh, anything else on updates from staff? Yeah. So the monitoring program. Um, this is kind of. I'm going to tie it to the uh, first item, which was the affordable housing data management system. So the monitoring program, we are currently sending you know, notices to the inclusionary owners. So we have sent first notice, second notice, third notice. A lot of them were not responding. Mm -hmm. So um, we finally sent uh, the final certified letter to the owners. So we're still working on it. It's been it's been a tough program, but we are trying to stay on top of it so we can get a higher response rate. So right now I think we have like an 80% response rate, which has been really good because mm -hmm. in the past, just looking at past records, the response rate was not very high and staff wasn't really following through and trying to achieve a higher response rate. So we're working on that. Um, at, what point, at what point did it send the sheriff button? 
Uh. <laughs> we don't do that anymore because they charge us? Yeah, so. they used to. I've seen records in the files um, where they used to do that. Yeah, yeah, part of the challenge is, so we, this is, put this in perspective. We started this process in January. And we are going to be starting it again in January. Yeah. Okay. A nine-month process takes a lot of resources. Yeah. Um, for again, limited return. If, if you stop and think about, it. if somebody fails to respond to the monitoring, it is a non-monetary default on a deed of trust. Okay. Our our cure for that would be to go to court and ask for authority to foreclose on a non-monetary default. I don't think we're going to find a lot of judges that would approve it, and I don't think politically the Board of Supervisors would allow us to do it. I don't think you know what the 20% you're not getting responses from the point, though. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's, you've got 20% of, of the fairly consistent. that you don't know if they're or living there or whatever yeah. kind so, of beats the program. So I, I know you, you're, to your point, you could sell a unit if, they're, if they've got right. advantage and don't have approval, but you know, sell a unit and put it in the market and get somebody who wants it. So uh, before you continue your report, is that another area that the supervisors could help? I mean, if there's something that could be worked out to where there wasn't this charge involved, is that something that would help you identify what's going on with this inventory? Is it, well, I, you know, I, I, you don't have to answer that. That's yeah, a question I'll pose and let it, let it hang yeah, and, I, I and think, continue yeah. your report. So, yeah, so the monitoring program is one of the ones that we want to digitize and have the, you know, the system generate the letters that go out mm -hmm. and mail them out and then have the uh, occupants, the uh, inclusionary owners, respond via, via submitting them electronically to us. So that way, great, you know, we just, they check the, the box that they submitted a copy of their utility bill, they check the box that they submitted a copy of their homeowner's declarations page. And then we just check to make sure that it is what they said they submitted. We check it off and sign it off and we we can generate reports as to the response rate. So we're just trying to make it more streamlined so it, it's less work, you know. Streamline that part and spend more time on the 20%. Yeah, Good there idea. you go. Yeah. Well, maybe your inclusionary consultant will have some best practices on mm -hmm. how to most effectively yeah. right. collect, you know. Good. Thank you for that. So, yeah, and then loan activity is the next item here. So loan activity just bring you guys updates as to any other loan payoffs we have received and I think since then remember my last report from last time I don't think we have received we had already received that large one last time so currently there's still some in the pipeline that are coming through hopefully soon but they are still in escrow so they haven't paid us off but you know just to let you guys know I've been trying to stay on top of what's been outstanding and keep pushing, making sure they, they pay the money if it's due. Okay. Any questions about those reports? Okay, our next meeting, item uh, 9, is our next scheduled meeting is November 14th. Can I see a show of hands for people who know right now they're not going to be on vacation or they might be around then? So that's Karen, Mark. Not sure. Rosie's not sure. Wes is not sure. Yeah, Wes is in. <coughs> Wayne is not sure that I'll be here. He Wayne, Wayne, Wayne will be around. Be so around. Um, it helps, you know, if we could calendar it now, that'll help with the quorum. So Mark, you will be around? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's near. It's approaching. It's not quite the holiday. I think the next week is the yeah. holiday time. But, um, and uh, and I'll remind well, that one, that one would have a Natalia and, and Tyler. Well, I'm going to see them in the next few days. I'll remind them. That'll help us keep that get that quorum so we can get things done. Mm -hmm. So we'll be looking for a motion to adjourn. I, I make a motion that we adjourn. Wayne so moves. Is there second. a second? Rosie seconds. Any discussion? No. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 No. Aye. Thank you. Aye.